My name is Thomas Bowen, and I'm the Director of African American Strategic Engagement and Executive Office of DC Mayor Muriel Bowser. And it is a pleasure to kick off our series entitled Required Reading, books that we believe that everyone who dare calls himself a Washingtonian who comes to live in our city just ought to perhaps consider reading. And today we have my good friend, Professor Derek Musgrove, who is the author of the phenomenal book, Chocolate City. Derek, it's just so great to be in your presence again. Oh, thank you for having me, Tom. Let's get at it. So Chocolate City, how did Washington District of Columbia become known as Chocolate City? Well, folks on the street started using the nickname uh, somewhere around the uh, 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 mid-1960s. Uh, DJs on WOL AM, uh, you know, Kathy Hughes Station, or at the time the Hughes Family Station, picked it up, uh, and they began saying it. And so you're talking about, you know, Nighthawk and, and some of the other really popular African-American DJs. Um, and it began to sort of circulate as, as the city's unofficial nickname. The, the first time that people outside the city really began to pick up the nickname was in 1975 when Parliament Funkadelic cut the <laughs> album Chocolate City. Yes. Now, they had heard it from people in D.C. They had a huge fan base in the city. They really loved uh, doing shows in the city. Um, and uh, in fact, some of, the, some of their other more popular songs actually came out of interactions that they had with fans in the city. Um, and they, they cut the album title track was Chocolate City, the title of the album was Chocolate City, and what it symbolized for people, both as an unofficial nickname and also when it was put onto the album cover of P-Funk, uh, was that it was a, the first major American city with a majority black population. Wow. Uh, but not just that, it was also a city that was bursting with black culture, mm -hmm. right? And of course, you know, we, we get the nationalization of the nickname through black culture yeah. in the P-Funk album. Uh, but then the last and most important thing is that the nickname starts to circulate right when DC has the return of small d democracy mm -hmm. for the first time in 100 years. Uh, around 1968, we get our first elected school board uh, since roughly the end of uh, Reconstruction, the so first local election since the end of Reconstruction in the 1870s. Uh, um, and by the time P-Funk's album comes out in 1975, we have seated for the first time that January, the first uh, elected mayor and council uh, in a hundred years solid. Mm -hmm. so when, you, when you mentioned that small D democracy, mm -hmm. I think you address that more in chapter six of your book uh, when it talks about um, self-governing. Mm -hmm. um, and there are many people I, I think who don't understand um, that long struggle and long history that DC has had in that regard. Yeah, I mean, look, D.C., when it's it's founded, um, uh, everyone expects that the founding fathers, when they carve out a federal district, expect that there will be democratic governance in the District of Columbia. But quite frankly, the founding fathers never figure out a way to do that. And so, so, you know, one of the architects of the Constitution, James Madison, says in Federalist 43, of course, a local legislature will be afforded the people of the federal district. Mm -hmm. And then he has another note a couple of years later where he says, you know, the closer I get to the issue to try and figure out how Congress can have control over the federal district, which is written into the Constitution, and they will also have local democracy. He said, the closer I get to the issue, the more nettlesome it becomes, the more difficult it is to figure out how exactly that will work. Um, and the founding generation essentially does not figure it out. Uh, the, the first people to figure it out, and to figure it out quite badly, mm -hmm. um, was the Sixth Congress. And so in 1800, as part of just a political deal, last minute political deal by a lame duck Congress, they decide that Congress will effectively have total authority over the district and there will be no local democracy. Mm -hmm. that people here will not vote. Um, folks on the streets, uh, you know, uh, gave an uproar about it, those, yeah. those who could vote, which is a very small number of right. people, essentially rich white men at the time. Um, and so Congress gave them local governance. They, they gave them a, a city government, first partially appointed, then eventually fully elected before the Civil War. Um, and it's during the Civil War that that government becomes biracial. Mm -hmm. uh, African Americans gain the right to vote in local elections in 18. Uh, uh, 66 going into early 1867 
Uh, and so you have, in, in the late 1860s, early 1870s, these biracial governments, African Americans are serving in all the ward offices. Um, the, the mayor owes uh, his election in 1868 to, to uh, primarily to African American voters. Um, and there is a, a very uh, virulent racist reaction to that, uh, which really culminates in 1874 in Congress determining that, uh, well, we don't want African Americans to vote in D.C. In fact, we really don't want poor white people to vote in D.C. We really only want the type of democracy that we envisioned way back at founding, which is, is landowning white men. Um, and so since it's going to be hard to figure out how to do that now that the genie's out of the bottle, yeah. uh, we're just going to go ahead and end democracy altogether in D.C. Uh, and so starting in 1871, but, but then being sort of formalized in 1874, uh, you have no democratic governance for right. the District of Columbia. And the city is ruled by a three-person commission appointed by the president. Mm -hmm. And that lasts for a hundred years. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the 1880s, 1890s, 1920s, 1940s, there's no local governance right. in Washington, D.C. And the congressional committees that oversee the district's budget are really the prime movers mm -hmm. in how the city is governed. And they, I should point out, govern it horribly. I think that one of the things that we forget in our conversations about uh, congressional uh, stewardship of the district is that they assume that Congress actually does a reasonably good job <laughs> of, of running the city, and right. they just don't. Right. Um, they don't keep the books. Uh, the first time the city has a, a serious audit mm -hmm. is under Mary and Barry mm -hmm. in the 1980s, mm -hmm. uh, and it costs millions of dollars to do mm -hmm. uh, because the, the papers are everywhere. Mm -hmm. Most of the city agencies are sort of linked up to federal agencies that are their counterpoints. So the local Department of Labor is linked to the federal Department of Labor. Um, and so nobody knows how much the city is spending. Nobody, nobody knows, you know, sort of, in fact, when Mary and Barry gets into office in 1978, Nobody can tell him how many people work for the city. Mm -hmm. That's a product of yeah. congressional mismanagement. Right. Um, but of course, we get the return of home rule uh, through the Home Rule Act of 1974, and then that, that government is ceded in 1975. And we've essentially had that ever since. Uh, and the city has been much better run mm -hmm. uh, as a result. Yeah, I know that uh, Mayor Bowser um, highlights as often as she can the fact that the residents of D.C., we pay our taxes. And we pay more taxes than um, at least one state um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the country uh, that the men and women of, of Washington, D.C. serve um, this country uh, in, the, in the military. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so the, the idea that people impose um, their uh, authority uh, or try to uh, is it, just um, not acceptable. And so I'm glad that also uh, one of the beauties of your book is that you look at that small d democracy and see uh, the steps. Yes, uh, District of Columbia, um, the emancipation took place prior to the Emancipation Proclamation uh, that mm -hmm. Abraham Lincoln um, had signed. Uh, but, but then um, it's, it's a longer walk to, to get to the idea of, of home rule. Yes, a, a much longer walk. Um, I mean, look, I, I think that a lot of DC residents are very aware that there is a disconnect between the promise of the Declaration of Independence, all men are created equal, mm -hmm. and the Constitution, uh, which allowed for slavery, which allowed for a disfranchisement of women, which allowed for a disfranchisement of a majority of the white male population who did not own land. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we have over time mm -hmm. begun to narrow that gap between the two, that contradiction between our two founding documents. One of the places where we've really struggled to narrow that gap, and it's in Congress's court to do so, uh, is in the governance of the District of Columbia. Um, we have, uh, you know, since 1975, effectively returned home rule, local government to the district. What we haven't yet done or, or devised a, an acceptable to all different parties um, uh, approach to doing is figuring out an issue, the issue of national representation. So we have non-voting delegates to the House of Representatives. We do not have voting representation in the House or in the Senate. And that matters. That actually matters. I mean, it matters when you're talking about, you know, uh, members of Congress sitting down to negotiate about Metro. Uh, it matters when D.C. residents want to have a say in who's elected to the Supreme Court. 
Um, and of course it matters uh, because Congress gave us home rule. Congress is capable of taking home rule away. Uh, and in fact, some uh, more reactionary members of Congress are threatening to take home rule away today. Uh, they did it just this past uh, Friday. Uh, and, and so, you know, that still remains to be resolved. It's a contradiction that we inherited from the founders. Um, and unfortunately, we just haven't figured it out. Which is why statehood is so important. Yes. Um, that as they try to push the ball back, we continue to try to push uh, the ball forward. And one thing is that uh, Mayor Bowser has kept her eye on that and she continues to fight uh, for D.C. statehood because we just know um, that there are some people who like nothing other, other than that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, this, you know, one of one of the the, the the approach to resolving the contradiction between the um, uh, it, you know our, our current status and, and the rights sort of laid out in the, the um, uh, Declaration of Independence is statehood. Uh, it's the one that more than eighty five percent of district residents voted for uh, in twenty sixteen. Uh, it's the city's chosen strategy for resolving this contradiction. Uh, we've laid out through our non voting delegate uh, Eleanor Holmes Norton. Uh, before Congress, uh, HR 51 and S 51, uh, and uh, in the House of Representatives, uh, you know, a majority of the members, uh, uh, I believe, all Democrats this time around, uh, co-signed it. I mean, so this is really a remarkable feat. Uh, you know, the last time we had state, we voted on statehood in, in the House of Representatives, uh, about 150 people voted for it. Uh, we have well over 210 co-sponsors yeah. on uh, HR 51 today. Problem is we, we do not have a, a majority in the Senate. Um, at least two Democratic senators, uh, and so two short of what you would just need to get to 50, um, have stated their, their discomfort with uh, doing away with the filibuster. Uh, and and their, their lack of full-throated support for statehood. Uh, and so, so those two cannot be counted on for, for an affirmative vote. Um, and, and so, you know, it appears that things are stalled uh, at the present moment. Um, and so we'll see what happens. Uh, but but I, I, I think it is important to continue to put this issue before the American people, um, to not let them rest and to claim full democracy when indeed uh, just shy of 700,000 people at the seat of government uh, in the nation's capital uh, don't have access to national representation. I listened to Mayor Bowser um, just uh, last week. Uh, as she addressed some students at Charles uh, Houston Elementary School, and she remarked, as we are in the in the midst of Black History Month, that we celebrate Black History um, every month here in the District of Columbia because we have so much history uh, to celebrate. And uh, as she said that, I thought about the fact um, that I worked in the Wilson Building, and now we have a statue of Mayor for Life, Mary and Mary, um, outside the Wilson Building, which Mayor Bowser unveiled along with the four masters uh, there. And I think about um, the summer youth employment program, mm -hmm. now uh, named by Mayor Bowser as the Marion Berry Summer Youth Employment Program. And people in DC will quickly tell you um, that it was Marion Berry who gave me my first check. Yeah. Um, but the, the legacy and the history of Marion Berry, uh, it runs deep in our, our community. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, I mean, look, DC has a wonderful and rich African-American history. Um, and the reasons are obvious. It's always had a very large, it's always had a very uh, affluent, and it always had a very activist African-American population. So there was large numbers of African-Americans before the city was actually, in, in the area before the city was actually founded. Um, the black population has never, for more than a year or two, dipped below 20%. Uh, and since in 1957, we were the first major American city to have a black majority in the United States of America. Went all the way up to 70% of the population in the 1970s. Uh, and, and 80s. Um, and some of those individuals, uh, you know, shaped the landscape around us. And you mentioned John Wilson, who's a famous veteran of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Uh, he was chairman of the council, and, and the Wilson building is named after him. And then, of course, there's Marion Barry, uh, easily the most influential black power activist in the city's history, and in easily one of the top two most influential political figures. Uh, in the city's history. You can put him up there with Alexander Shepard, uh, the, the famous political boss of the Reconstruction period. Um, and, you know, Marion Barry began uh, in the 1960s uh, working on jobs programs 
um, where he's essentially hiring people to do uh, work that needed to be done. And so this is specifically with Pride Incorporated, uh, his Black Power organization in the 1960s, where he was hiring young, young people to do uh, neighborhood cleanup. Uh, he brought that idea into the mayor's office when he uh, won the position in 1978 uh, and, and created the Summer Youth uh, Jobs Program. Um, and, you know, you've, you've, you've seen this program uh, come down to us to the present day uh, where large numbers of young people are getting their first employment yes. experience through this program. Yes. Uh, and it, it's, you know, it's been a, a great opportunity for large numbers of people, including my co-author, uh, Chris Myers-Ash, who's a DC, DC native uh, and got one of his first jobs through the, the Summer Youth Jobs Program. There, promise me that we can talk about this book again, uh, that you are free of time in your schedule, that we could come back here and, and talk some more because it's impossible uh, to really um, give a book, um, a true picture of, of your book um, in just a few uh, moments' time. Um, but my staff and I, when we were sitting down, we knew that the first book you were going to discuss as part of required reading for living in the District of Columbia is the book, Shopping City. So thank to you, and thank you to also to your co-author. Well, thank you for having me, and I'll absolutely come back anytime you want. All right. Thank you. Thank you.